disasters are both natural and human induced like floods drought landslides avalanches earthquakes tsunami chemical nuclear emergencies and epidemics every year we suffer at the hands of these calamities and suffer heavy due to their detrimental impacts disasters also disrupt development leading to a slowdown in the economic growth rate therefore to be able to achieve the desired targets of sustainable developmental goals sdgs progress should remain resilient and uninterrupted the dm act 2005 along with the prime minister's 10 point agenda on disaster risk management drm realm calls for integrating the principles of disaster risk reduction across all developmental sectors also the sendai framework for disaster risk reduction drr to which india is a signatory under its four priorities and seven targets focuses on building economic resilience and promote ease of living with this aim of making our nation disaster resilient the national institute of disaster management was established on 11th august 2004 at new delhi with the responsibilities for human resource development capacity building training research documentation and policy advocacy in the field of disaster management in the backdrop of the international decade for natural disaster reduction a national center for disaster management was established in 1995 in the india institute of public administration by ministry of agriculture and cooperation the center gained impetus with its redesignation as national institute of disaster management under ministry of home affairs which was constituted under the disaster management act 2005 as a premier institute for training and capacity building for disaster management The campus of the National Institute of Disaster Management spreads across 7 acres. This campus has been constructed with modern technologies following latest GRIHA and green building norms. State of the art infrastructure facilities has been provisioned for the faculty members, staff and researchers who can work in a highly conducive environment to achieve the vision of NIDM. executive director of the institute who is also the member secretary of the institute and its governing body runs the day to day administration of the institute nidm has total 86 sanctioned post 57 for new delhi campus and 29 for southern campus to make the country a resilient nation highly dedicated and proficient nidm team that has been selected constitutionally work relentlessly along with the executive director which is seva medal recipient major general manoj kumar bindal to achieve the mission of resilient and disaster free india nidm is engaged in international capacity building process too international cooperation is our one of the critical and most important mandates for building resilience where we have been engaged on a regular basis inclusive drr with leaving no one behind is our motto establishment of child centric drr center for gender studies and special focus on persons with different abilities are the key interventions in this regard NIDM is committed to the agenda of mainstreaming gender in disaster risk reduction. The institute maintains a strong focus on integrating gender concerns in the disaster management cycle. For this, capacity building programs are run exclusively on the issue along with including it as a cross-cutting issue in other initiatives. NIDM has established India Universities and Institutions Network for Disaster Risk Reduction to address the agenda 6 of 10 point agenda for drr of honorable pm which stresses on the need to develop a network of universities to work on disaster issues in india nidm has a geometrological risk management division that hosts three specialized centers center for early warning and communication center for hill area development and center for coastal disaster risk reduction and resilience 
in addition it has three more centers one center for flood monitoring the second one on emergency operation center and the third one is world center of excellence on landslide disaster reduction resilient infrastructure division of the institute caters to training and capacity building of the engineers architects and town planners of the country serving various line departments as for example municipalities pwd phe rural engineering towards the vulnerability standards documenting disaster effects affected sites for reconstructions and implementing all the things under national building code developed by bureau of indian standards nidm since its inception has considered climate change disasters and extremes at the fore of its research policy and training agenda at nidm we focused on environmental changes as a key driver of risk that includes not only climate change but also the attributes like land use landscape and natural resource degradation we host a center of excellence on climate resilience under the national action plan on climate change nidm provides year round internships and dissertation opportunities for students pursuing masters and higher studies from various disciplines across india under the mentorship of nidm faculty members forestry biodiversity and animal inclusive disaster risk reduction section of the ecdrm division of nidm is basically concerned with imparting training and enhancing capacity building in the areas of forest conservation forest fire management agroforestry conservation of biodiversity mitigation measures to lessen the threats to it associated global and national acts regulations policies nature based solutions for climate crisis and its impact on the three segments of forestry biodiversity and animal inclusive disaster risk reduction nidm is building capacity of stakeholders like engineers architects and urban planners for making urban development as resilient development and to make cities disaster safe nidm is also helping various cities in developing disaster management plans of urban areas India Disaster Resource Network (IDR) is a web-based platform for managing the inventory of equipment, skilled human resources, and critical supplies for emergency response. An IDM campus is equipped with latest IT infrastructure, including internet lease line, Wi-Fi connectivity, CCTV surveillance, latest office equipments, IT-enabled training halls, video conferencing tools, emergency operations center, etc. Even during the COVID-19 pandemic, an IDM continued its capacity building activities with the help of latest e-learning tools. NIDM receives 100% grant from Ministry of Home Affairs. Recently, NIDM has established its two campuses at Rohini, Delhi, and Southern Campus at Krishna District of Andhra Pradesh. NIDM is promoting capacity building in disaster management through online courses and self-study programs, which are informative, convenient, and user-friendly. NIDM imparts training both in-house and off-campus in collaboration with. state and ut governments to senior and middle level officials non government organizations researchers students and grassroots members working in the department the library of the national institute of disaster management has been acting as a crucial resource and learning center to meet the information needs of its faculty staff member research scholar from india and abroad the institute is diligently working towards fulfilling its core mandates with the utmost zeal and commitment and envisions to become a full fledged university in its endeavors to make india disaster resilient the vision of the institute is to be a premier institute of excellence for training and research in disaster risk reduction also be recognized as the leading institution at international level in the realm of disaster management and strive relentlessly towards making a disaster resilient india by promoting the culture of prevention and preparedness at all levels an idea is ever
very good afternoon to all. Myself, Shubham Badola, young professional at National Institute of Disaster Management Center for Hill Area Development. And I welcome you all to this webinar on International Geoethics Day, titled Geoethics with focus on geo heritage, geo tourism, and geo conservation. First of all, I would like to thank our partner, Sri Rajendra Ratnu, IAS Executive Director, NIDM, and Program Chair, Professor Surya Prakash, for giving us this opportunity of conducting this webinar. I would also like to welcome our keynote speaker, distinguished speaker, program convener, and my program coordinators who are there today with me for conducting of this program. Uh, I would like to give a short glimpse of the Geoethics Day. Uh, International Day of Geoethics is an annual observation dedicated to promote ethical and responsible behavior in the field of geosciences and environmental sciences. This day is celebrated on first Thursday of Earth Science Week each year, highlights the importance of considering ethical principles in the study, exploration and stewardship of the Earth and its natural resources. It serves as a reminder that the pursuit of scientific knowledge and sustainable practice should always be guided by ethical considerations to protect our planet and future generation. So with this, I would like to call upon Professor Surya Prakash to please give welcome address for this webinar. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Shivamji. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay, I think some uh, network signals are poor. Uh, so, first of all, <clears throat> let me congratulate and wish you all the best for the International Geoethics Day that we are observing during this week uh, of this year. Uh, we have uh, been actually working for geoethics for quite long time now. And uh, the other related areas of geosciences, which pertains to our geoheritage, geodiversity, geotourism, geoparks, and other related areas have also been well integrated into this uh, discipline of geoethics to take care of our possessions and values related to geoscientific importance. And uh, before I go ahead, I must thank our uh, Secretary General of International Association for Promoting Geoethics, Ms. Sylvia, Dr. Sylvia Papaloni, who has been uh, one of the uh, pioneers and uh, key drivers uh, to taking this movement of geoethics forward at the global level, taking uh, all the national coordinate, coordinators along with uh, the uh, headquarter uh, professionals and also our treasurer Giuseppe Di Capua from Italy who also kindly joined with us and let me also welcome on behalf of uh, IEPG India Professor Dr. M.G. Thakkar who is currently the director for uh, the National uh, Institute of Paleobotany which is uh, located in Lucknow uh, he has very kindly agreed at a very short notice, along with our other expert speakers like Praveen Ingle and also our uh, supporter, uh, Dr. Neil Ratan from uh, Central Institute of Mines, Fuels uh, and Ener uh, Energy Research, a wing of Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in India. Uh, we have actually been supported not only uh, with these limited number of resource persons and experts uh, or distinguished speakers in fact uh, we received support from all our professional associations related to geosciences and earth sciences uh, be it the indian national scientific academy be it the geological survey of india or geological society of india and at the global level international union of uh, geosciences uh, which has also uh, joined hands with IAPG 
in spreading the message of geoethics, which is one of the prerequisites for earning credibility amongst the society to uh, attach values to the geoscientific uh, uh, no outcomes and research education uh, which uh, needs attention from our society earth science particularly in india has not been very popular subject area most of the students who do well they go either to engineering or uh, to other scientific and technological lines rather than geosciences However, geoscience uh, has contributed a lot because all developments which take place are uh, happening on the land. And it's our scientists who know the best about the attributes of these land areas and landscapes and land processes, uh, which help them to do better and more effectively uh, for the developmental purposes than any other profession. However, the society yet needs to be convinced and conveyed about the importance of geosciences uh, through our uh, works, uh, which uh, require attention because a number of our geological possessions of high value, which carry even the legacy values, have been lost because of the developments, which are quite chaotic sometimes and unplanned. Without caring for the uh, geological treasures they come across, which actually reveal us the history and evolution of the earth its processes and uh, the resources that we are obtaining from the earth. So therefore, uh, we have come together and uh, we have been uh, organizing number of activities. Along with other activities also, we are including lectures on geoethics so that we can emphasize the importance of ethics in all our practices. And also on the other hand, we have been requesting our colleagues to kindly come up with standards, guidelines, policies, regulations, and even if necessary, some legal provisions or laws or statutory uh, measures which can help us undertake necessary activities uh, to uh, preserve, to protect, and to conserve all the uh, geological uh, resources uh, which uh, are very much required for uh, passing over to the future generations as heritage to them because they have high legacy values, not only in terms of their history and uh, their uh, no attributes, but also they are quite unique, rare and beautiful, uh, which uh, should be enjoyed by our future generations too, as we have done so. So these uh, words, uh, I welcome everyone and hope we will uh, focus on all these important areas of the uh, this year. We have also again observed the International Day for Geodiversity as well. And we are also working on geoheritage, geoparks, and geotourism too. In India, we have got around uh, more than about three dozens of uh, sites of geological importance which have been declared as geoheritage sites and also about uh, more than dozen of sites have been actually uh, set out for uh, geotourism as well. We are in the process of identifying uh, the geodiversity areas which also need to be preserved, protected and conserved against the destruction of mankind. So basically in geoethics, we are focusing on our human activities related to the arts environment where through our interventions, we are uh, actually uh, destroying the heritage and uh, treasures of the earth, which uh, need to be protected. So, and that is one of our side. The other side, we are also talking of the behavioral practices and actions being taken by our geoscientific professionals too, and their duties and responsibilities towards our society so that we carry our duties with moral responsibilities, uh, which are uh, to be executed at, uh, I would say, in uh, all the levels and all the scales, uh, be it at the global level, we say the global level of ethic, which is universal and should be followed by everyone at any place at any time. And then national level, which are projections at the uh, countryside levels and need to be taken care. Then provincial, 
and social as well as individual levels. So we have to have objective as well as subjective ethical practices amongst ourselves, ourselves and this will not follow until and unless we have a good conscience and we uh, actually uh, try to uh, learn the value of it in our practices and behaviors and activities. So with these words, I would say what Vivekanandji has said that the time has actually alerted us. So kindly arise, awake and stop not till our goal is achieved. And our goal is preservation, protection and conservation of geological heritage and attaching significant values to the geoscientific professions in the society. So with these words, I uh, thank uh, the uh, organizing committee for providing me this opportunity to share my views. I am sure our experts will surely talk uh, very details about uh, how we are proceeding ahead and what can be the uh, effective roadmap to achieve our goals uh, and uh, go ahead with our uh, more uh, effective practices uh, with the uh, adequate uh, standards, uh, codes, guidelines, procedures, regulations, and laws that may also be parallelly required. I have always been per persuading my colleagues for following up a new subject area as social geology, which can actually integrate uh, society and geology together and can bring together the uh, social tools for the geologist and also uh, to the sociologist, philosophers and psychologists, uh, the uh, values of geological information, uh, which can be carried forward and utilized for the betterhood of humanity uh, as well as environment and our resources. This will also help us in disaster risk reduction and resilience too. So these words I thank and uh, uh, hope uh, and wish all the best to everyone of you, along with the distinguished speakers, distinguished guests, dignitaries, delegates, and the participants of today's program. Thank you very much. Back to you, Shubhamji. Thank you very much, sir, for motivating and welcome address. Uh, since we are joined with USCPD Kupa, sir, I would request him to please say a few words on th this webinar. Over to you, sir. Thank you for giving me uh, the possibility to, to say a few words. I, I really happy that um, IPG India and NDIM has organized this event. Uh, this is the seventh edition of the um, International Geoethics Day. Um, and uh, I hope that also in the, in, the, in the next years we will have the same success as uh, this year. Um, I, I have uh, also uh, included the, in the in the chat uh, the link to the website of the International Association for Promoting Geoethics. Uh, I invite you all uh, to to follow the activities of the of the IAPG. Uh, I remind you that now uh, IAPG has uh, um, as in cooperation with the IUGS has uh, created the, the IUGS Commission on Geoethics. So now. Oh, there is also a branch of the IU, uh, of the IPG that uh, um, uh, is developing activities uh, directly within uh, the uh, International Union of Geological Sciences. This is a great recognition uh, for uh, our activities in the last uh, uh, in the, in the in the past uh, ten uh, years. So, uh, in uh, I remind you that. Uh, uh, becoming members of the IPG is uh, uh, without fee, so I invite you all uh, to become uh, members uh, of the IPG if you are not uh, already uh, done in the, in the past. Thank you. Thank you and uh, have a nice, uh, a nice work for this uh, um, uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So moving forward now, uh, I would like to call upon uh, Professor M.G. Thakkar. Before that, I would like to give a short introduction about him. 
He is working currently as a director at Birbal Sahani Institute of Paleo Sciences, and he has been working as a, a geologist for, after completing his PhD in neotectonics geology from MS University, Varodra, and he has uh, also been awarded with uh, many uh, awards. Along with his research interest, he has also authored many books research articles also presented many international and national conference papers with this i would give the stage to you sir please hello my the uh, video is not visible, I think. Uh, sir, your is video, video? Visible, sir. Uh, sir. Yes, sir, yes. Okay, and uh, I'm audible, okay? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, actually, my, my um, laptop is not working, so uh, I have requested Neil to uh, present on my behalf, the uh, operate the slides on my behalf, okay? So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, good afternoon, uh, the organizers and the uh, renowned speakers, uh, international speakers. Uh, uh, my topic for this keynote is: Does the geoethics leads us to geo and ge geo tourism in India? The topic is very critical in terms of the uh, the development. Development in the sense, the infrastructural development, mines and in other industrial development. But before we have talked much about the, uh, I'm talking about the uh, Indian scenario. We have talked much about the geo heritage. Last maybe five years, we have been uh, discussing about the geo heritage. Mm -hmm. And there are hundreds of sites we have discovered uh, basically it is not the game of last two, two, three years, but since last two centuries, we have identified several hundred uh, sites, geologically important sites, but we did not give the tag as geo heritage. But uh, uh, last two and a half decades, when uh, UN, United Nations, UNESCO has given the sustainable goals, then we come to know that, yes, this all sites has to be preserved and preserved for the conserve for the next generations because once it has been lost it will not come again and we we cannot see it because ruthless minings are there everywhere in the world so uh, uh, we must now learn about something where we can stop the things but if we stop the mining and other activities infrastructural activities there will be a big issue whether we will uh, go for the proper uh, development, but what is proper development? So the sustainable goal came uh, in front of us. But before we go for the as far as India is concerned, uh, we must learn about the geoethics, the stalwarts, those who are uh, today uh, uh, in the meeting meeting they have actually given the uh, proper definition of the geoethics okay uh, can you change the slide so we uh, we now think we must think about uh, when does any country uh, think about geoethics geoethics is a larger terminology but before that we must think about the ethics in all sense ethics in all aspects in mass behavior, we should be more ethical in social communications, in economic practices, in developmental pursuits, in omni sphere, we have to be ethically strong. And then we actually think about the geoethics. So then comes the sense of the accountability towards the natural resources we use every day since the beginning of the human era. But we are more concerned with the last two centuries. Since then, we have industrial development, 
and we have cut the mines and many other geological resources, natural resources ruthlessly. So that this actually this word came. So next. Uh, defining this geoethics, the uh, the the uh, the speakers today's speakers, uh, Papoloni and uh, uh, Giuseppe Capua, they have actually uh, given us these definitions, which I would like to to read just now. Geoethics consists of the research and reflection on the values which underpin appropriate behaviors and practices. With the ethical, social, cultural implications of geoscience knowledge, education, research, practices and communications, providing a point of interactions for geosciences, sociology, philosophy, and economy. It represents an opportunity to geoscience for geoscientists to become more conscious for their social role and responsibilities in conductivity. It is a tool to influence the awareness of society regarding problems related to the geo resources and geo environment. So these are this encompass everything you if you have seen the uh, definitions, uh, it means uh, it encompass almost all spheres of the life which the human uh, dome we, we have created. So in context of the society, Geoethics is connected to several aspects. One is environmental conservation. Geoethics promotes responsible stewardship of the Earth's resources and advocates for sustainable practices to promote the environment. It addresses issues such as biodiversity conservations, climate change mitigation, and the preservation of ecosystems. In terms of the social justice, geoethics recognize the importance of equitable distributions of resources and benefits derived from the earth sciences. It aims to address social disparities and ensure that the benefit and risk associated with geological activities are shared fairly among the different social groups. It also pertains to the hazard management because geoethics emphasize the uh, ethical considerations in assessing the managing and managing natural hazards such as earthquake, volcanic eruptions, landslides. It includes proactive measures to reduce the risk, communicate hazard effectively and prioritizing the safety and well-being of the communities. It also pertains to the scientific integrity that geoethics that promotes ethical conduct in scientific research, including the transparency, integrity, and accountability. But looking to all these aspects, we should know that where the India is standing next, where India is standing in geoethics thinking. India has made significant strides in recognizing the importance of the geoethics and incorporating it into the policies and practices. India faces various challenges including earthquakes in landslides and water resource management. We have implemented measures to address these challenges, such as establishing institutions and organizations focused on the geosciences, disaster management, and environmental conservation. India has been actively involved in international collaborations related to the geoethics, such as participating in global initiatives on climate change, mitigations and sustainable development. The Indian government has also taken steps to promote environmental awareness and sustainable practices through policies and programs. So we'll look, uh, we'll focus on some of the positive aspects which India has actually uh, taken. Uh, all these uh, stakeholders and the processes or the initiatives and missions they might have some lapses, but uh, the Indian government, government of India uh, and the state governments of each and every state, they have started several programs, which basically uh, somewhere they are they are actually touching to the geoethics. Okay, so we have some policies and programs. So let us look, uh, focus on the 
some 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 uh, policies which Indian government has taken over. The National Action Plan on Climate Change (NAPCC), which o o outlines the country's strategies and initiatives to address climate change, and it includes policies and programs related to the renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable agriculture, and afforestations. All of which are crucial aspects of the geoethics. Mm -hmm. Another is National Disaster Management Authority. Okay. It, is, it is responsible for formulating and implementing policies, plans and guidelines for disaster management in India. It focuses on preparedness, mitigation and responses to various hazards, including geological hazards like earthquakes and volcanoes and landslides. The environmental impact assessment is one of the processes which is also important in terms of the geoethics. Another uh, e institution is a National Green Tribunal. This initiative, NGT, is specialized environmental court in India that deals with cases related to the environmental protections and conservations. It plays a crucial role in addressing issues concerning the integrity of the environment, including those related to the geology and geosciences. The national mineral policy that India has formulated a national in, uh, mineral policy that focuses on sustainable and responsible mining practices. So these all are basically uh, our initiatives in India. But how far we really uh, go uh, in terms of the uh, ideal geoethics, that is a big questions. But as far as the initiatives are concerned, we have done enough work. Another uh, mission is Green Clean Ganga Mission. Clean Ganga Mission, that is also known as Namami Gange, is a flagship program of the Indian government aimed at rejuvenating, rejuvenating the Ganga River. It includes initiative to address pollutions in Ganga, promote sustainable water resources management, and restore the ecological balance of the river basin, thereby incorporating geological geoethics principles. Some other programs are also there, the National Afforestation Program, National Water Missions, Coastal Regulation Zone Notifications, that also actually uh, it comes under the umbrella of the larger umbrella of the geoethics. There are some other programs, National Green Clean Air Programs, Sustainable Development Goals of the uh, UN, uh, UNESCO, that also is uh, taken care in most of these programs. GSI, Geological Survey of India, is also a prime uh, premier organization. I think it is 172 years old. Okay. This is the prime organization in the country for geological research survey. It plays a vital role in understanding the India's geology, mineral resources, geological hazards and environmental aspects. So by and large, to conserve, reserve, preserve and protect these geologically important sites, some natural sites uh, of geological importance for the academic and research, the, the stakeholders, major stakeholders in uh, India is Geological Survey of India. And I think several sites they have actually conserved and preserved in India, more than 50 sites uh, are known and they have made uh, a point of geotourism. So looking to all these uh, uh, policies, the you know, po uh, programs uh, that highlight India's commitment to addressing environmental and geological challenges while incorporating ethical considerations. They aim to balance development with environmental protections, sustainable uh, practices, and ensure the well-being of both present and future really uh, do we really uh, working on the protections uh, as per the uh, rules which is actually applicable for the uh, in the world and to make the geo park selecting several hundreds of geo heritage sites we have to think about it not we still need further discussions about uh, making a geo parks and making ultimately 
uh, uh, promoting the geo tourism. So, so geo heritage, as everybody knows, that it refers to the unique geological features. Okay, that uh, landscapes or natural phenomena that have significant scientific and educational aesthetics and cultural value. Geo heritage sites provide valuable insights into our history processes and evolutions. They showcase our the rare geological land formations. Uh, mountains, caves, canyons, fossils, which are often irreplaceable. Irrepla so, GRD sites contribute to scientific research, education, and public awareness of geology and the environment. So, uh, how we can actually conserve and preserve this GRD site? There is the only one way we can do is geotourism because it involves the revenue also. It involves the uh, uh, the uh, benefit to the government and also benefit to the society in terms of the uh, in in terms of the getting knowledge. Okay, so geotourism is a form of tourism that focuses on promoting geo uh, promoting and conserving the geotourism sites, allowing visitors to appreciate and learn about Earth's geological wonders. <laughs> It aims to promote sustainable tourism that respects and conserves geoheritage sites. It involves the responsible travel practices that minimize the negative impact on the environment and local communities. It also encourages visitors to engage with local cultures, traditions, and educational programs. Geoheritage and geotourism play a vital role in preserving Earth's geological wonders and promoting sustainable tourism. So, looking to all these aspects, right from the geoethics to geo heritage to geo tourism and conservations, in India, last several hundred, several tens of years, maybe several decades, we have identified several hundred sites. Maybe more than three hundred sites have been identified. In recent years, in recent years, last I mean last two years, uh, we proposed a separate volume in geo heritage. A, a separate volume, so an Indian volume name that that special volume is uh, named has as the uh, the Indian geo heritage from the Precambrian to the present. It has received more than 45 research papers and 30 are now published. The uh, the uh, very important and striking uh, thing is in the history of the geo heritage journal. Uh, uh, this is the largest volume having 45 research papers. So this paper actually uh, encompasses almost more than 100 geo heritage sites. We have I have just uh, given the glimpses of some 30 uh, published papers name and what actually it actually uh, highlights different sites. So it means that we have identified several hundred sites geo heritage site, but are we really capable enough to make the uh, geo parks uh, which encompasses several several geo heritage sites with the criteria which international commission or the unesco has given uh, 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 regarding the land and some other infrastructural facility uh, since i have worked in kutch mostly last three decades i have worked in kutch so some of the couple of the sites actually we have identified some hundreds uh, geo heritage sites in Kutch, but here uh, I can because of the time constraint I can show you only couple of geo heritage sites which are of very important and some of the sites which basically uh, are now uh, in the verge of uh, uh, vanishing. So uh, let us have a uh, the the uh, kind of slideshow where you will see some of the sites. This is the sites where uh, it is very important for the active tectonic point of view and neotectonic point of view. It's a big nick point. Uh, this is a gorge. Uh, next, it is a gorge, which is uh, the, within the periphery of the Buj city. Uh, then you can have several other uh, geo heritage related sites, which are uh, of geomorphic, geomorphological importance, which is the geological importance because Kutch has Jurassic and uh, Cenozoic geology, which is known to the world. Which uh, we have several uh, hundreds of sites 
out of which some of the sites which are ecologically important let us look here uh, some of the ecologically important sites in terms of the culture also so these sites are now in the verge of actually verge of extinctions if you look at larger uh, in the in the larger scenario if you see in gujarat uh, maybe we uh, there are another 50 or 100 sites uh, i am not explaining each and every sites but this site is a, uh, it, it, it is very important in terms of the sea level changes last 200 200000 uh, years of the sea level changes there are very important uh, important features that shows that last glacial interglacial period uh, so uh, in terms of the quaternary to to mesozoic we have hundreds of georitic site but out of these hundreds of sites in gujarat this is the only one site which we uh, actually conserved and preserved which is jurassic fossil wood uh, uh, this is basically uh, uh, we are we we uh, got the funds from the government of Gujarat, Ministry of uh, Tourism, as well as the district administrator like uh, collectors. So this is very important site which we preserved. Uh, earlier it was very in bad bad shape, this uh, Jurassic fossil wood. Uh, around this Jurassic fossil wood, we have found very good uh, ecologically important sites. Next, you can see uh, uh the the jurassic fossil wood site has uh, migratory birds frequently uh, in the winter season they are coming so by and large we can have a very good trail also so in 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 terms of the uh, the trail activities or uh, the the several uh, tableaus of uh, tableaus of several um, uh, vertebrates or invertebrate animals are also implanted over there so that it can it can it can give a, a sense of closeness to the land okay. this is one of one of the very important sites in in india the uh, rajasaurus dinosaur uh, it is actually rayoli dinosaur park uh, which is well developed it is the only well developed site in india with with uh, almost investment of almost 60 to 70 crore rupees and there is another site in Bhuj, which is actually the dream project of uh, our uh, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Bhai Modi. It is actually earthquake museum, but actually a, uh, this earthquake museum is uh, we can convert it into the one of the geo sites or geo path because several hundred uh, uh, fossils are there and uh, the processes with three dimensional or four dimensional uh, uh, picturization is also given and it is one of its kind and it gives the uh, actual earthquake and other uh, scientific act uh, geological uh, geological activities to the common people so these are some of the uh, uh, sites which is going to be vanished within few days or few months so next a few slides that is actually dedicated to the, uh, the geologist. I think uh, next few years you won't see this kind of these sites. Uh, and these are very important in terms of the several geo geological processes, PETM process or any uh, Paleocene, Eocene boundary, Eocene, Oligocene boundary formation of the uh, petrochemicals, uh, uh, hydrocarbons. For this, this site is very important. and. I think within few days, this this condensed section of Eocene, Oligocene, and Miocene is going to be vanished. So we have to now think about the future generation geologist. But since we have started the uh, practices of geotourism, I think we will be able to uh, at least conserve some of the sites. Uh, with with uh, our efforts, uh, when I was in uh, 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 Kutch University, there we actually form this department of earth and environmental science where there is a state of art museum where almost 10000 fossils and other rock collections are there for the those actually they wants to study uh, intricately the kutch geology so such kind of uh, practices can also be started in a cluster level in each uh, uh, area 
so that we can at least uh, preserve some of the specimens. Thank you. Next. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think you have given a brief description how you are working towards saving the geo heritage sites. Hello. Yes. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. And uh, I think I cannot see, sir, any question now. If it will be, we will share you over the email. Oh, sure, sure. I think it is over the time. Five minutes uh, over. Yes, sir. Yes. So, Sorry, sir. Now moving to our next speaker, Dr. Silvia Papaloni. She is an Italian geologist, researcher in the field of natural hazards and risk science. R writer also she is an international frontline scholar on geoethics. In 1996, she earned her master's degree on geosciences from Spangia University of Rome. In 1997, she obtained the professional qualification and enrolled in the geologist register and in 2001 received her PhD in earth sciences. She is a PhD geologist, researcher and currently a researcher at National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology, Rome, Italy. Her scientific activities are focused on natural risk and hazards, geomorphology, engineering geology, and ethical and social aspects of earth sciences. She is founding member and general secretary of International Association for Promoting Geoethics. And she is known for her fundamental contribution to development and promotion of geoethics. She is working on creating awareness about the growing impact of human activities on biogeological system and how to promote geoethics as a responsible way of thinking and managing the planet for creating safe and healthy interaction among humans and other biotic and abiotic entities forming the earth system. With this, I welcome you, ma'am, and thank you very much for joining us today. Over to you, ma'am. Afternoon, everybody, and thank you for this uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, allow me to, to thank uh, Professor Parkash and the uh, IPG India for uh, the kind invitation to this webinar to celebrate the International Geoethics Day 2023. I'm impressed by, by the great efforts that uh, you uh, have done and you are doing uh, to develop uh, geoethics in your countries. Um, I share my video. Okay. Okay. It worked. Okay. Well, I would like to introduce the concept of geodiversity, geoheritage, and geoconservation, and to analyze their meaning from a geoethical perspective. In other words, to explore their ethical and societal relevance, both for the geoscience community and society, in line, in line with the presentation of Professor Tankar before me. Well, the concept of geodiversity and geoheritage, as well as geoconservation, have assumed great importance for the geoscience community and are getting relevance also beyond the geosciences. Particularly, the concept of geodiversity is now internationally recognized for its importance for human beings and biodiversity after the recent establishment of the International Geodiversity Day by UNESCO on 6 October of every year. But let's give some definitions to clarify this concept. Geodiversity is the variety of natural elements such as minerals, rocks, fossils, landforms, and their the landscapes, soils, and active geological geomorphological processes that form and alter them and sustain life. So geodiversity underscores the various ways in which Earth's geological history has manifested within a specific region. Just as biodiversity 
encompasses the range of living organisms in an ecosystem, geodiversity encompasses the range of geological elements in a landscape. It recognizes that the Earth's surface is a dynamic mosaic of geological processes and formations, each with its own unique history and significance. Understanding and conserving geodiversity are important actions for various reasons. First of all, for scientific studies, geodiversity provides valuable insights into Earth's histories, past environmental conditions, and the processes that have shaped our planet. It aids scientists in studying past climate changes, tectonic activity, and other geological events. Cultural and aesthetic value, because geological features often have a, a cultural and aesthetic significance contributing to the identity and heritage of, of a region. Landmarks like canyons, caves, mountains can hold spiritual, historical, or artistic value for communities. And also in education and outreach value. Geodiversity is a valuable educational tool, helping to raise awareness about Earth's geological history and processes. It engages the public in understanding the dynamic nature of our planet. Ecosystem support. Geological features can influence local ecosystems by affecting soil types, water availability, and habitat diversity. Protecting geodiversity can indirectly contribute to biodiversity conservation. Recreation and tourism. Unique geological formations and landscape often attract tourists and outdoor enthusiastic contributing to local communities and economy, economies. Overall, geodiversity is a fundamental aspect of the natural world that complements biodiversity and cultural diversity, contributing to a holistic understanding of Earth's complexity and the interconnection of its various components. Geoheritage. Geoheritage comprises those elements of Earth's geodiversity that are considered to have significant scientific, educational, cultural, aesthetic, ecological, or ecosystem service values. Meaning those elements which are priceless and irreplaceable assets, not only of each nation, but of humanity as a whole. So geoheritage refers to the unique geological features, landscapes, and, uh, and sites of geological significance that hold scientific, educational, cultural, and aesthetic values. These features are often preserved and protected because of their importance in understanding Earth's history, evolution, and processes. The concept of geoheritage emphasizes the need to conserve and appreciate Earth's geodiversity, similar to the conservation efforts directed towards bio, biodiversity and cultural heritage. It also plays a role in education and raising awareness about the significance of Earth's geological history of, for science and society. And geoconservation. Finally, geoconservation consists of a set of actions to ensure that the planet, that is the set of rocks, landscape, waters, soils, but also human forms, cultures, and activities that locally shape the territory, is adequately protected from those human interventions that degrade and damage the Earth system, compromising its use in the future. So geoconservation refers to active and deliberate efforts to protect, 
to conserve and to manage Earth's geoheritage, including its diverse geological features, landscapes, and processes. Similar to the conservation of biodiversity and cultural heritage, geoconservation focuses specifically on preserving the planet's geodiversity and the scientific, educational, cultural, and aesthetic values associated with it. Well, key aspects of geoconservation. Geoconservation includes preservation of geological sites. Geoconservation involves identifying, designating, and managing specific geological sites and landscapes of importance. These sites can include unique rock formations, fossil beds, mineral deposits, volcanic fissures, and other geological elements. Scientific and educational value. Geoconservation emphasizes the scientific knowledge that can be gained from studying Earth's geological history. Preserving geological sites provides opportunities for research, education, and rising public awareness about Earth's past and processes that have shaped it. Cultural and aesthetic significance. Geological features often hold cultural and aesthetic value for local communities and society at large. Geoconservation helps maintain these connections to the past and fosters an appreciation for the natural beauty of Earth's landscapes. Sustainable tourism and recreation. Geoconservation can support the development of responsible tourism and recreational activities that allow people to experience and learn from geological sites while minimizing negative impacts. Community involvement, yes, engaging local communities in geoconservation efforts fosters a sense of ownership and encourage stewardship of geological sites. Collaborative efforts ensure the sustainability of conservation initiatives. Protection from negative human impacts. Engaging local communities to mitigate potential threats to geoheritage, such as urbanization, industrial development, mining and erosion, which can degrade or destroy valuable geological features. And more, legal and policy frameworks. Geoconservation often involves establishing legal protections, management plans and policies to ensure the long-term preservation of geological sites and landscapes. And finally, collective endeavor. Geoconservation is an endeavor that involves all the components of a community, geoscientists, educators, policymakers, local communities, and conservationists in protecting geological sites and managing resources responsibly, even in the perspective of preserving sites for current and future generation. And therein lies its intergenerational significance. Well, why are these concepts so important to geoethics? There is a profound interconnection between geoethics and these three concepts. Geoheritage, geodiversity, and geoconservation respectively identify the object of attention of humans' action on the abiotic natural environment, and that is geoheritage, its intrinsic and peculiar qualities, geodiversity, and the actions that safeguard its existence, geoconservation, even in, in a context of natural evolution. In the geoethical vision, the geological elements, such as geosites, geological landscapes, and landforms, 
are not considered simple components of the territory which stimulate human curiosity. They are the witnesses of the evolution of the earth, our own. They guard the secret of the origin of life, our origin. They constitute the abiotic identity of the places we live, the bedrock of those social ecological systems in which forms and processes of human communities are interpenetrated in the forms and processes of natural ecosystems. And for these reasons, they express the natural vocation of the territory. They are geomorphological expressions of a planetary reality made up of continuous exchanges, material and immaterial, of flows of matter and energy between its constituent biological and mineral parts. And finally, they are the tangible elements through which we understand the role and responsibility we as humans have towards the planet, as in them we find answers to some of the existential questions we have always asked ourselves. Basically, biodiversity, bioheritage and geoconservation are concrete expressions of a geoethical vision of the planet. Recognizing their importance as a means to restoring an inner connection between humans and the earth is a fundamental starting point to develop best practices in land management. Geoethics grasps the social cultural significance even before the scientific significance of geoheritage and the importance of geodiversity and geoconservation through which it is possible to recover the sense of place and strengthen the feeling of belonging to one's territory. So the connection between those concepts and geoethics lies in their shared goal of promoting the responsible stewardship of Earth's geological landscapes and resources. While geoheritage, geodiversity and geoconservation emphasize the protection and appreciation of geological features, geoethics emphasizes the ethical values that must guide our interaction with the Earth's geological environment. The interplay between them and geoethics involves making ethical choices, responsible choices related to management, protection, conservation, and usage of geoheritage. Prudent actions for using geological resources for the benefit of present and future generations. Geoethics guides the ethical considerations that inform strategies, practices and policies employed in geoconservation initiatives, minimizing negative anthropic impacts. And finally, I would like to focus on other two elements already mentioned by Professor Tankar before me, two elements that are the tangible, concrete tools through which geoethics promotes the protection of geoheritage and enhancement and conservation of geodiversity. I'm referring to geoparks and geotourism. Geoparks are protected areas that showcase and conserve significant geological heritage. They aim to protect, conserve and promote ge geological features, landscapes and processes, while also fostering local communities' social and economic well-being through responsible tourism and education. In the slide, you can read the official definition provided by UNESCO Global Geoparks. Geoparks encompass a range of geological features such as rock formations, fossils, minerals, landforms, and other geological phenomena. 
they often include interpretive center, trails, guided tours, and educational programs that provide visitors with insights into the earth history, past climates, tectonic activity, and more. As consequence, at the moment, as consequence, visiting geoparks allow rising public awareness about the importance to understand the geological processes and to protect and conserve geological diversity. They are typically managed by local authorities and organizations in collaboration with the local communities to balance protection, conservation, education, and economic activities. In a geoethical perspective, geoparks embody the principles and values of geoethics and convey them to society. Values such as a deeper appreciation for the natural environment, its protection, conservation, and sustainable and responsible development. Educational significance about how her system works and evolves. The tangible demonstration of the possibility to combine population well being and respect for the physical and biological environment. Furthermore, geoparks benefit local economies by involving local communities in their management, promoting a sense of belonging to their territory and encouraging active participation in protection, conservation and education initiatives. All these benefits are also true for geotourism. Geotourism is a form of sustainable tourism that offers to visitors the experience of the geological heritage, the enjoyment of geological landscapes, the knowledge about rocks, minerals, fossils, and the geological history of a specific region. And by encouraging responsible visitation and rising awareness, geotourism helps safeguard these valuable resources for future generations. The definition of geotourism in these slides is provided by Newsom and Dowling in 2010, a form of natural area tourism that specifically focuses on geology and landscape. It promotes geotourism to geosites and the conservation of geodiversity and an understanding of earth sciences through appreciation and learning. This is uh, achieved through independent visits to geological features, use of geotrails and viewpoints, guided tours, geoactivities, and patronage of geovisitor centers. So geotourism has an undeniable educational, cultural, and economic potential, but to unfold its full potential, Geotourism must be practiced respecting certain requirements, the same that, uh, that are already applied in the enjoyment of geoparks. Requirements that must be implemented even when the geotourist destinations are not included within protected natural areas. To this aim in geoethics, we refer to the concept of responsible geotourism. Responsible geotourism is geoscience knowledge based, respectful, inclusive, locally beneficial and empowering, educational, careful to end the user's needs. Geoethics encourages a responsible approach to geotourism and suggests that the definition of geotourism should be adjusted to incorporate the geoethical principle of, ge of re responsibility. And so this is the, uh, the uh, definition, the last definition we have uh, proposed uh, to, to connect geotourism to, geo to geoethics. Geotourism is a responsible tourism focused on earth systems 
geo objects carried out by following a geoethics oriented approach to the AB abiotic, biotic, and cultural relationships of an area. It is tied up to the understanding, interpretation, and enhancement of geological forms and processes. It aims to lead the tourist to perceive time that shapes geosites, landscapes, and landforms, and the sense of place of a territory by appreciating its geoheritage and geodiversity and pursuing its geoconservation. Geotourism combines a form type of geological significance tourism with a geographical approach to a sustainable and inclusive tourism capable of empowering the land identity of local communities and having a geo-environmental educational and formative relevance for current and future generations. It is important to, to highlight that responsible geotourism cannot be separated from adequate geological and geoethical training of geotourist operators. So, geopark and geotourism are a bridge between science, education, culture, and sustainable and responsible development. They are strictly connected with the foundation of geoethical thought because promote respectful and responsible behaviors and sustainable practices towards the physical environment and human communities. In, sil in simple words, they exemplify geoethics in action. So I, I finished, I conclude, and I, again, I thank you for the attention and I thank you also and congratulate with the IAPG India for the great job done to develop geoethics, a great example, a great service for all the geoscience community. Thank you all. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I thanks again you for joining us and providing us with the insights of geo geoethics on geotourism. Once again, thank you very much, ma'am. This time I cannot see any question. So if we will have, we will share it with you. So moving to our next speaker, Dr. Kushagrar Rajendra. He has more than 15 years of rich experience in institutional leadership, capacity building, teaching, research, and publication in multidisciplinary area of environment and sustainability. His expertise lies in sustainability education and a cross-disciplinary understanding of environment. He had obtained his PhD in interdisciplinary aspect of environment from prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru University and for the same was awarded distinct like academic excellence medal, the president of India gold medal. He is an institutional builder and also he has been established, also he has established the prestigious lead lab for capacity building program in green building with GBCI and USGBC at MIT University, Haryana. He is actively engaged with research work and also guiding the uh, students for their PhD thesis. He has undergone several FDPs, capacity building program, summer courses and delivered popular lecture on earth and environment science, including inspired program for science popularization. With this, I would like to hand over the stage to Dr. Rajendra. Over to you, sir. Sorry, sir, you are muted. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible now. Thank you very much for generous introduction. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, respected dais, particularly Professor Prakash and Professor Thakkar, who is like teacher for me. And along with that, our old uh, <coughs> partner in the uh, uh, this uh, uh, evolution of the concept of geoethics uh, from Italy, <coughs> uh, Dr. Kapua and uh, Dr. Silvia. 
so today is a uh, today we are celebrating uh, geo days for day for geoethics <coughs> and in this context since our previous speaker has already uh, give a framework particularly silvia who is very uh, uh, very much into the uh, theoretical construct of the geoethics what to do what not to do <coughs> along with professor tucker who very briefly introduced about not only his own understanding but also the government uh, initiative to uh, streamline or you can say the mainstreaming the concept of the geoethics through i mean in totality through different actions and program so my role become very difficult to broad bring out perspective on the geoethics so i choose to discuss on the ethical consideration what does it mean ethics means and how geology and geoethics or you can say in the larger context environmental ethics and why there is a need of such kind of discussions and uh, implementation in the field through some of the human actions and i will also try to put some case studies in very brief to uh, mainstream this concept which is which is which is which is a need of time i can see it so i want to start with uh, one of the very famous uh, quote and <laughs> So be, uh, you all know the Mount Everest, and if, uh, so uh, when Mount Everest name came, then Edmund Hillary and Tanjung Norway name Nar Nargen came comes in our mind. But before that, there is there was one very energetic mountaineers who passed away unfortunately and able to conquer the Everest. He tried he goes for many expedition but fail, and his last expedition he was found fugitive, and his dead body was recovered only after uh, many decades. So very famous people used to ask, why you want to conquer Everest? So it is, it, it is a very simple question, but very difficult for mountaineer to explain. So he told, once he told, and it is very famous now, that I want to conquer Everest because Everest is there. So this is the construct today I want to make for the geo heritage or geoethical consideration. Whatever you see, we enjoy the life, you, you, you interact with the nature. It is only because it is there. Or I can say, while in my sustainability class, I used to emphasize this concept that we are using resources. Suppose you are using the uh, timber. It is because timber is there. Or our forefather has not exploited it completely. So this is the question that is very prominent nowadays. And here we can bring out the consideration of geoethics in, in that particular sense so ethics morality and mutual association is basically make us different from the animal otherwise human being is more, more in, in the biophysical term we are nothing more than animal we are animal only difference is that we are social animal so certain i mean the uh, character are impinged upon me that is completely social construct and that is the ethics so ethical consideration is basically dependent upon the kind of interaction we enjoy or association enjoy with certain things with particular things like we live so indian indian um, um, indian philosophy is very much into the nature i mean we not were we not only care about our family our uh, our uh, village or our community but we also care for we worship tree we are see the forest we are very much connected very much associated and due course of time it become in our value system so as uh, one thing i also try to bring from the sylvia presentation that in definition of geoethics he mentioned a term value so this value system is very important to uh, to uh, formulate the concept of ethics so so we are the, the level of our association or layer of level of our contact or interaction with any particular thing is, is basically foundation of uh, our ethical consideration that uh, put forward and it decide the action or with that particular uh, uh, thing I, I can say so uh, and that so the our association in present and that is basically uh, directed or streamlined by the our association with that particular thing in the past basically going to give you 
what kind of association we will have in the future. So the past, our interaction with the past is very important, whether it is with the plant, whether it is with the nature, with the soil, with the rock, with the mountain. So it is very important that how we see our past. So one of the very important thing I want to mention over here, when you go for the class, uh, particularly when you teach the rock and minerals, so we come, uh, we, we say very, I mean, the, although it is a very social quote, if you want to, if you want to experience past, touch a rock. It means the rock is nothing, but it is the, it, it will going to give you a story from its genesis to what it is today. The, the, the kind of uh, changes it, uh, it face due course of geological time history. So, so in that sense, past can be visualized at four different layers. The first three layers is basically is our association with the living organism, first three association. And the last third, fourth level of association will be our association with the non-living aspect of the nature. So what are those four? The first one is the historical. So anything we see, it has some historical connotation. Like if you see Taj Mahal, we see the red fort, or we see the some uh, Colosseum in, so that is the historical. So we have a very different sense of belongingness to that particular monument because we feel that it is from our clan or it is from our race, it's human being uh, 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 effort that result into that. We are so advanced in the past or we are not advanced in the past, that kind of. If you go further deep down, then it become archeological. So where we correlate ourselves with our evolution, story of evolution. Like we go to the Bhim Betka and we find the moral, the paintings, rock painting that is 10,000 to 30,000 year old. Then we, we feel that how our forefather is go, about to uh, uh, enjoy the life and what kind of consideration or constraints they used to feel. So similarly, everyone, we try to connect ourselves that we are from the same clan and the mother Lucy is the central point where you all get originated. We originated from Africa and moved to the Asia. Some clan goes to the Europe kind of thing. So archaeological material we think. Third association is basically you can see now we are moving some distant. So now the living organism and that is called paleontological. So the third level to see the past is paleontological. When you see the fossils of a dinosaur or egg of a dinosaur or a, a head of a, the primitive elephant from Siwalik. So we have feeling that it is living organism also grown on this land where we are dominating today. And the fourth, last, but very much central for today's discussion, and that is the geological. Geological means anything that is from the past, that is for the geological time scale, whether it is living or non-living, it doesn't matter, but it carry how uh, how earth form and how it passes through different geological time scale and it come today. So our association with all the four, five, la five layers, uh, four layers of the past determine the kind of ethical consideration to that particular, particular thing or particular material. So, so there is two aspects. One is the bi biological, one is non-biological, what is geological in the nature. Even in biological, there are different gradation of our ethical, ethical consideration, like uh, typical biological ethics, uh, I am going to little bit uh, emphasize over here, that we do a lot of genetic experiment with the bacteria. So their, their ethical consideration never come in my mind, so whether we have to do, whether we have to change their genetic makeup or not. But when it comes to the human being or larger animal, then certainly ethical consideration has started coming, whether we have to change their genetic makeup or not. We have already, uh, uh, I mean, the, come up with the dolly, I mean, the uh, hybrid, uh, uh, hybrid, uh, uh, I mean, the, I'm just forget the name particular, but we never think of to make clone of the human being because there is a lot of churning in our mind whether we should do such experiment with the human race or not. 
So the central point is that the kind of association with our the material or thing we have, it decide our ethical consideration, our ethical parameter. So similarly, if then if you go to the non-biological or beyond a particular time frame, geological in nature, then certainly there must be geological consideration. But our theoretical constructs construct suggest social construct suggests suggest that the extent of the ethical attachment is going to little bit lesser than what we have with the first three, whether it is historical, paleontological, or <coughs> archaeological. Now, but suddenly we started talking about geoethics in such extent, then it comes to our mind. It's it's it, so geoethics, it seems some offbeat subject. Why is typical geologist or typical student of earth science or environmental science or sciences, why there is a need to uh, go through the geoethics? And similarly, a social science people might think, what is need a science people is talking about the ethics. It is our domain, let's uh, we uh, take care of this. But there is very, uh, very fundamental reason to it. And I am going to give you three, four different examples, how it is, it, it is required to discuss today, why to consider geoethics for our day to day, whether it is a profession, whether it is a, whether it is the kind of work we do and interaction with the nature. So I will give the first example. My, I will put my case with the very first example and everyone know about it. And it is a well discussed topic that is Aral Sea. I am pretty sure that everyone knows about the Aral Sea. Aral Sea is the four, Aral Sea was a fourth largest reservoir of fresh water on this planet. Fourth largest reservoir. The area of Aral Sea was by 1960 or 1950s, you can be the more conservative. The area was 68, around 70,000 kilometer square, square kilometer area it had. So just imagine how big it is. In, in, in context of uh, Indian, you can say it is larger than many a state like the Jharkhand. It is larger than the Jharkhand. So big the water body it is. It was. But now it is shrink to 10%. Now it is turned into the toxic desert. There is no water and hardly 10% water left. And that too after making a dam in the north side. What happened to that? And who is responsible for that? So the finger might turn toward us. It's the science come people, it is the geology people, it is the engineers who plot the destruction of Aral Sea. So the sea, the kind of, so the, the, the region I also know, because we want to have the more economic de development, we want to produce more cotton. So the two river that used to feed the two great civilizational river, Amudaria and Sidaria, they used to feed the Aral Sea, but we have to divert it entire water for cotton production. Although we have gained some short term, I mean the developmental uh, uh, trophy. So Uzbekistan become the largest product producer of the cotton. Russia became the USS, it was the time of USSR. But nowadays, if you go, you can find in the uh, uh, Navy vessel inside a desert. So that's why there is a need to talk about the geoethical considerations. That's why we need. Second case study, I put my case with the example, uh, the river, uh, very, uh, very, very holy river in India, not Jamuna, Ganga, I'm going to talk about the Jamuna. So Jamuna originate from Jamunetri and it fall down from the mountain to the plain at Nagpathar. And from there, it passes through several uh, townships and finally come to Delhi. From Delhi, it moves toward uh, one of the holiest place of the Hindu uh, culture, Mathura and Brindavan, where Lord Krishna, it was the, it was the activity place of the Lord uh, Krishna. And then it finally merged with the great Prayagraj. But it is, it is very interesting to know that from Jamunotri reaching up to Delhi, we squeeze out all water from Yamuna. There is no water when it enters the Delhi. They just see. And who is behind that? It is educated people, it is professional people. Under the dictate of the ruling class, they squeeze out all the river. Forget, I am not going to talk about that we have to produce agriculture productivity. 
but at the cost of the cutting down a river. So how long your productivity is going to survive? And whatever you see, well, I mean, the uh, in the Ramuna nowadays, it is nothing but it is our domestic waste. So this is the kind of, and third, that is very, I mean, the recent in nature, that some of the tragedies that we face in the uh, natural disaster, natural calamities. But the last, in the last week, we, it is in the Tista in the Assam, uh, in the North Sikkim, where 1200 worth, crore worth of a power project has been bust, bust out because of, I mean, the uh, gloof, I mean, the uh, brusting of the glacial lake. So that's why there is a need to understand, to stimulate the concept of the geoethics. So geoethics is going to talk about your association, your value system with the nature. And it's great. It's great that we have very good social construct and how to go to, I mean, the preserve, how, but how we are going to develop the value system? Who? What are the way? And there is, I agree that there is a there is a degradation of the social eth social ethics as well. But at the same time, we have collapsed as far as our geo, geo ethics is concerned. So these are the some of the aspect of the problem. So let's talk about the now I have discussed the problem, but let's talk about what is the hope you have. The kind of the human activity and their impact the is pinging upon us is basically result of the our intense social behavior. It's we responsible. And this uh, social behavior is nothing but it is it is summation of our individual behavior. And a very good example is the uh, your table salt that we consume every day. Every people, not a single person on this globe who do not have the table table salt daily, but you know it contains microplastic. It is the same plastic than everyone is used like anything. So it is going to ocean and from it churned down, turn into the microplastic and deposit it at the course, at the sore line where your salt is extracted. And it finally transported to every household. Then look, see and consume the microplastic that you brought on this earth in last 100, more, hardly 100 years for the last 100 years. So what are the solutions? So a very, very innovative uh, approach has been adopted by some countries, Latin, particularly Latin American countries. New Zealand is that, for example, and few cases study from the Canada that bring a completely new perspective to it. And that is giving legal rights to natural resources, geological resource, natural uh, legal rights. I mean, give a so Although in Indian constitution in 175 years back, it talked about the conservation of forest, conservation of nature, conservation of water, but that one mandate, not mandatory, but it is in the directive principle, what should be. But the, 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 the story begins with the Bolivia, a Latin American country. It give legal status to river. It means river is like a human being. And if you give a legal status to a river, it means to have the, all the fundamental rights what the human being has. We enjoy. So, and what, what can be the fundamental right of the river? Free flow, conservation of their ecological system, and what, what not? What not? I'm seeing what not. So, so now it has become the mandatory for government to safeguard their fundamental right. I mean, the fundamental right of a river. This is one example. Another very good example from uh, New Zealand, uh, particularly, I think, in North Island, uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, aboriginals, although the dirt term is not the term is very racial. So uh, the, the, there is Maori. They their their entire livelihood is basically in the nature with the river, with the mountain, with the national park. So everything is, is a part of their life. So that particular system has been given a living rights. And who make the custodian? It is the Maori people 
and government representative is their custodian or they are the guardianship. So with the help of guardianship, and now this is a very good case study. But why I'm talking in the context of India? India also that effort has been, I mean, taken by one very famous uh, judgment 2017, Uttarakhand High Court, given legal personal value uh, status to River Yamuna and Ganga. And who make custodian? The custodian was our guardianship was by the chief secretary of state. Unfortunately, only the government representative was the guardian. So the fallacy is that fallacy was that it is the government many proposals or many projects are majority of time is not in interest of the river, whether it is the making a dam or uh, making a multi-purpose uh, project, including the extraction of river and others. So government of India has a very good case to 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 I mean the file in the Supreme Court against this declaration because they have very good point. And that point is if you make a guardian, uh, guardian of the river to a government uh, employee, then what about if some damage is caused by river? Suppose there is a flood in the river. So very, very, very interesting. I mean, the very funny thing. So government come up with the Supreme Court, then okay, kindly quest this order because if the river uh, is very infamous for the flood and if the damage is going to, I mean, the ask for, um, uh, <coughs> compensation, who is going to pay that? The chief secretary is a very, I mean, the paid staff, paid employee of the government. Why is going to pay all these things? So on this very simple legal reason, Supreme Court rejected this, I mean, the quest, the order of. So it was always a very good opportunity that we should learn from the other experiences. But instead of providing proper safeguard to river, Supreme Court taking the uh, escape route and rejected the plea. So this is one of the aspects that I already mentioned. I'll try to streamline or mainstream the concept of the geoethics. So uh, last but not least, I again quote um, uh, John Mallory and I want to conquer Everest. And he told, very famous, because it is there. So it is very pertinent to preserve our geo heritage sites, stones, The, one of the interesting topic, although the name is very, con, 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 I'm very difficult to remember. Even I used to forget. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if you is uh, overlap the entire uh, life scale, uh, uh, life of the Earth, I mean geological time on a watch, 24-hour watch, and also overlap the human existence on this Earth, then you will find. The human being on this earth for last three seconds. Human beings, I mean, it is not the human sapiens, but little bit earlier, like the human kind of, uh, 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 I mean, the uh, species. So we are here for the last, just last three seconds. Out of 24 hours, our existence on the earth for the last three seconds. And in just last three seconds, effectively, much, much lesser, even the fraction of a second, because last 500 or 600 years is very important. And that too, last 100 years or 150 years. The fraction of second, the activities of our fraction of second make such a situation that nobody is going to say with the full confidence that we are going to stay on this planet for the next second or fourth second. So with that word, I conclude my case, I hope, I am able. I am I able to contextualize the today uh, webinar. Thank you very much, and my regards to all my teachers and participants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for joining and enlightening us with the knowledge. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Parveen.
असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर जी एस टॉम्पे आर्ट कॉमर्स एंड साइंस कॉलेज एफिलियटेड टू एस जी बी अमरावती यूनिवर्सिटी टू गिव समरी एंड वे फॉरवर्ड फॉर दिस वेबिनार ओवर टू यू सर ऑडिबल यस सर यू आर ऑडिबल ओके ओके कैमरा इज ऑन और थैंक यू शुभम सर for giving me the opportunity for summary and vote of thanks uh, dr thakkar had said that the geo tourism visitors have diverse motives and interest interpretation therefore needs to meet the requirement of a broader spectrum of wider audience from the uh, needs the specific site related geological and educational information for the dedication tourist and those actually seeking to learn about the geology of an area to the broader interpretation that will engage and enthusiasm the casual tourist and those who simply wishing to be there and enthusiasm the casual tourist and those who simply wish only so that their experience is in enhance but also that their awareness of geo heritage and the need for its conservation is increased dr silvia pipolonia and dr kushagra tells about the geo ethics and geo conservation depends on better public awareness understanding and support which tourist geo tourism has a vital contribution to make and in achieving these goals strong geological stories that appeal to the imagination are essential but the visitor experience for both dedicated and casual tourists can be enhanced through exploration of the connections between geo heritage and the cult and the cultural landscape now it's time for vote of thanks good afternoon all i feel honored and privilege to get the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on this special occasion i would like to thank all the honorable delegates who blessed us with their presence i am also very much thankful to all the program advisory committee members and the invited speaker words are not enough to thank their constant guidance and support to shape the webinar on the behalf of the organizing committee convey deep regards and heartly thanks to all to our honorable guest professor mahesh thakkar sir who graced us with his kind words i am sincerely thanks to dr silvia pipolonia gosipa d kapua and dr kushagra rajendra sir for his valuable guidance today is my words are not enough to express the gratitude to professor surya prakash sir and rajendra ratnam sir for his for his help and guidance and uh, that radiated a source of energy with us i would like to thank head of department professor dr yadav kumar malve sir dr nitratan sir and shubham sir who help us and support us at various stages i am very much thankful to the nidm team members it will, will have been impossible to organize it with their support if time is money then today we, you have spent millions for us thank to all of your for making this event successfully thank you sir shubham sir or thank you very much sir for summarizing the uh, session and also giving vote of thanks uh, so now i would like to request dr yadav kumar malve head department of geology sgb amravati university to give closing address for this webinar
हेलो यस सर I think uh, he is unable to connect with us, uh, so I request request uh, uh, to English sir. Uh, what of things has been done, sir? Clo closing remarks. Someone. Ill Nathan, why not you give the closing remark? Nilatan, why not you give the closing remark? Okay, I can also give closing uh, remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, I am thankful to uh, Suvir Prakash sir for uh, his guidance. Uh, program was uh, very good. Uh, all the speakers are given their talks in very informative way and it was a very informative uh, program uh, by this program uh, we are able to know about geo ethics geo heritage geo, geo tourism and geo conservation and broadly we got sense about geo heritage geo conservation and geo ethics so I am thankful to each and every one and all speakers and all at each. So Sir, thank you. I, very much. I have a request to host if few are there also can own the video so that we have a screenshot. Yes, yes. So request all the panel so that open their video and you have a uh, screenshot. So, so one please request. I also request to all the speakers yes. to share the video. Praveen is there? Yes, yes, yes. Nilratan, you also, I mean. So this is possible. Uh, okay, that's great. So now Sir is also there. So, Bum, I am uh, I am taking print screen. You can also take uh, print screen of this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think I think uh, sir. Uh, sir is not here. Uh, Thakkar sir is not here. Ah, uh, Thakkar sir may have left. I think. Okay. So is this, is this time to say goodbye? English, yes, sir, please yes. open your video. Yes, sir. I'm trying, sir. Trying? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just a minute. Video start. Okay. Not possible? No, I think there is some issue, technical issue. Okay, no, no problem. No, this is time to say goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you all for the. Uh, okay. Giving me the. Oh, now he's here. So, my pranam to everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Goodbye to all. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.